To understand astronomy, one needs to have some background. Here's my crash course on esoteric astronomy in six quick lessons. The Earth revolves about the Sun in a plane called the ecliptic. The twelve constellations of fixed stars that intersect the ecliptic are called the zodiac. All the stars of the zodiac are actually our close neighbors compared to the size of our entire galaxy. The Earth's equator is tilted some 23 and a half degrees with respect to the ecliptic. Gary Osborne's fascinating Paradigm Shift website shows how the angle of the Earth's tilt is symbolized in art. Here are Isis and Osiris raising the Jed, which amazingly matches the angle of the Earth's tilt. And here again the 23 and a half degree angle matches the slope of the pyramid on the dollar bill. Osborne has found this same angle symbolized in many other pieces of esoteric art. The Earth's tilt is the reason we experience seasons. The seasons are defined by the Earth's orbit, which contains two solstices and two equinoxes. Looking at the solar system from above, the seasons naturally make a cross. Witcher Inc. and Parlier call this the Earth Cross. Our galaxy is called the Milky Way because its myriad stars resemble milk streaking our night skies. If you were able to look at our galaxy edge on, you would see it as a flattened disk. This flattened structure is what makes the Milky Way look like a narrowly defined streak in the sky, rather than an even distribution of stars. The central plane of the galactic disk is called its midplane. The ecliptic is tilted some 120 degrees with respect to the midplane, naturally making a cross in two dimensions. Witcherink and Parlier call this the galactic cross. Imagine beginning a journey outside the galaxy, flying through the zodiac, passing by each one of the visible planets, and stopping on Earth for a while. After a short stay, you begin the journey home, traveling out past the planets, through the zodiac, and on toward the center of the galaxy. This route describes the mystical journey of the soul. It is mirrored in the Ptolemaic or geocentric cosmology that predated Copernicanism. The ancient Egyptians represented beginning and ending waypoints along the journey of the soul with silver and golden gates. Witcherink and Parlier show that the direction of the silver gate is located between the horns of Taurus as seen from Earth. You can find the horns by following Orion the Hunter's Club or Monoceros the Unicorn's Horn because both point at the intersection of the galactic midplane and the ecliptic, a point known to the Egyptians as the Silver Gate. Isis, shown with horns framing the sun disk, symbolizes her guardianship of the Silver Gate, or Gate of Birth. On the opposite side of the zodiac, the Golden Gate is located close to where the arrow of Sagittarius is pointing, and where the stinger of Scorpio is reaching. The Golden Gate is the second place where the galactic midplane and ecliptic intersect. The winged scarab framing a sun disk was used to symbolize guardianship over the Golden Gate, or Gate of Death. The scarab is an appropriate symbol because of how this insect pushes dung balls backward with its hind legs, mimicking the sun's retrograde processional motion through the zodiac. The coat of arms for the state of Vatican City features silver and gold keys because these are the keys to the kingdom that Christ gave to Peter. Pietro Perugino's fresco in the Sistine Chapel shows Christ giving one silver and one gold key to Peter. I see the two Roman arches flanking the fresco as secretly depicting the Egyptian silver and golden gates. The octagonal domed building in the center clearly represents the sun and the perspective grid must be the ecliptic. The people in the piazza are taking the journey of the soul. I was taught as a child to follow the outer edge of the Big Dipper to find the North Star Polaris. In the past this rule of thumb didn't always work because the celestial pole changes over time due to the Earth's precession. When the Great Pyramid was built, the star Thuban in the constellation Draco was the North Star. 
Remember, one of the pyramid shafts point at Thuban. The celestial pole actually traces out a circle in the heavens, representing the 25,920-year processional cycle. This cycle is called the Great Year. In 3D, the Great Year is seen as a processional cone swept out over time by the Earth's tilted axis. The Earth's processional cone, the Sun, and the galactic midplane will precisely align on winter solstice 2012. Author John Major Jenkins calls this phenomenon galactic alignment. The Mayan Long Count Calendar was designed to end on winter solstice, December 21, 2012. Acharya S. says in The Christ Conspiracy, many of the world's crucified godmen had their traditional birthdays on December 25th. This date is set because the ancients recognized that the sun makes an annual descent southward until after midnight of December 21st, the winter solstice, when it stops moving southerly for three days and was born again after midnight of December 24th. Thus, these many different cultures celebrated with great joy the Son of God's birthday on December 25th. Christmas 2012 marks the beginning of a new great year. The Milky Way galaxy has a rotational period that I like to call the galactic year. It lasts approximately 224 million years. Our solar system is related to the larger cycle through number. There are 8,640 great years in the galactic year. It's amazing how the Earth's processional cycle, the number of the Sun, and the decad harmonize with the galactic year. Astronomy grew out of the much older tradition of astrology, the belief that the movement of planets influences events experienced on the human scale. Astrology is the quintessential hermetic art epitomized in the motto, as above, so below. You might not be aware how interconnected astrology is with Ptolemaic cosmology, the tarot, and magic squares. Let's have a closer look. Viewed from above, the galactic cross looks like this. The red arrow indicates the direction of soul travel through the system. The galactic midplane is represented by the signs Taurus and Scorpio, and the ecliptic by Aquarius and Leo. These four together are known in astrology as the fixed signs. In the tarot, these signs adorn the corners of the world card. The eagle is the ancient version of Scorpio, and man is of course the water bearer. I see the Ouroboros as the orbit of the planets and the wands Isis is holding symbolizing the columns of the Silver Gate. The High Priestess card links the tarot with Ancient Egypt, Freemasonry, and the Kabbalah. Notice how the columns have capitals just like those in the hypostyle hall of the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. The Priestess sits between the Masonic columns Boaz and Jachin. The fruits behind her are arranged in the Kircher Tree of Life pattern. In the Kabbalah, each sephiro in the Tree of Life is associated with a particular planet. Rick Campbell of DCSymbols.com identified a lightning path passing through the Tree of Life that amazingly follows the Ptolemaic order of the spheres. This is the missing link between the Tree of Life and the mystical journey of the soul. In the Bible, Ezekiel had a mystical vision where he saw living creatures run and return as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Might Ezekiel's lightning vision be recapitulating the mystical journey of the soul? The 22 major arcana cards in the tarot map to the 22 paths connecting the sephiro in the tree of life. The suits, ranging from aces through tens, map to the sephiro themselves. The tarot is therefore highly correlated with the Kabbalah. A magic square is an arrangement of numbers in a square grid such that the numbers in all columns, rows, and diagonals sum to the same constant. In this case, it's 15. Here is the first magic square ever to be seen in European art. All rows, columns, and diagonals in this square sum to 34. 
Incidentally, the artist strategically placed these two numbers together to read 1514, the year the engraving was made. Yes, this magic square is part of Albrecht Dürer's Melancholia I that we've seen several times before. Luca Pacioli also studied magic squares and collected a large number of examples. I suspect Pacioli educated Dürer in the use of magic squares, as I already established their relationship in the Rome episode. A contemporary of Pacioli and Dürer, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, wrote De Occulta Philosophia, which drew on all the important hermetic books brought to light by Cosimo de' Medici that you learned about in the San Francisco episode. Agrippa explained that there really is magic within magic squares. Sigils can be encrypted within magic squares to call upon angels and demons. Agrippa associated magic squares of order 3 to 9 with specific planets. Why the sun was associated with the 6 by 6 magic square is simple. The sun is the sixth planet in Ptolemaic order. An interesting fact about the magic square of the sun is that the sum of all of its columns or rows is 666, the loaded number we saw in the detour to Winnipeg within the Jerusalem episode. We'll decode the so-called number of the beast in Paris, part one.